My name is Jeff Kloon. I am the Harris Associate Professor of Computer Science at the University of Wyoming and a Senior Research Manager at Uber AI Labs. Right, so to give you the best definition, uh, or the most accurate, would be a long discussion. But my favorite definition, which I think is inaccurate, yet maybe the most informative, is that artificial intelligence involves the things for which computers are not yet better than humans. I think that evolution has a key role to play as, as we push towards artificial general intelligence. And I think so for three reasons. The first is that the uh, community, the neuroevolution community and the evolutionary algorithms community has developed a lot of very important ideas that I think have a role to play in general AI research. Whether or not they ultimately be, are used on an evolutionary backbone or they're hybridized with other ideas from machine learning, I think the community itself has um, developed a tremendous amount of insights that are helpful and we're seeing them, those ideas spread into the wider machine learning community. Second is I think that evolution algorithms themselves may be a key technology uh, for evolution in terms of having a part to play in the overall solution uh, to AI. And third, I think that um, to some extent these names for different fields are metaphorical. And so if you think about evolution a little bit more broadly as the outer loop learning algorithm, which is to say that we have something that kind of moves and learns across generations and then something that learns within a lifetime that that outer loop, which in nature was evolution and in machine learning sometimes is specifically an evolutionary algorithm or sometimes could be a different, say, reinforcement learning algorithm, that outer loop, that is definitely going to be critical as we push towards artificial general intelligence. And some will call it evolution and some will fail to call it evolution. But at its heart, we're taking inspiration from natural evolution and evolutionary algorithms to do that outer loop activity, and that's essential. So I think that that will be key. And even more broadly, um, things that from natural evolution are essential to get into our algorithms to ultimately push to AGI, such as uh, interactions between agents and different niches and um, exploring and expanding uh, population through different niches. So uh, in many different ways, I think that evolutionary algorithms are going to be essential to our push towards AI. Uh, and we will see increasingly, and are currently seeing, that the machine learning community is starting to take note of that and play with a lot of the ideas from evolution under its various interpretations and, and definitions. So there are a variety of ways to apply evolution to robots, and my collaborators and I have pushed on many of those fronts. One thing you can do is directly evolve the weights of a neural network, whether or not it's small or large. And there's been a lot of work in the field of evolutionary robotics on doing that, and we have done some of that as well, including showing that evolutionary algorithms sometimes can produce the best uh, performance for given robots. Uh, one thing that we did really recently that I think surprised the community well, um, starting with work from OpenAI and then our group at Uber AI Labs, is we show that you can directly evolve very large dimensional neural networks, millions of parameters or hundreds of thousands, to say control a simulated robot or uh, a controller for an Atari video game, and that works just as well as traditional deep reinforcement learning algorithms. So that was quite surprising. Another approach is that you can uh, use an indirect encoding, which is an idea that's really been researched heavily in the neural evolution community, which is to say that you can evolve the weights of a small network and have that generate the weights of a much larger neural network. And that has benefits such as producing regular weight patterns that can exploit regularities in the world. For example, and a robot has four legs, then maybe you want similar neural controllers for each of those four legs. Uh, Etc. So, um, you know, work but that was pioneered by Ken Stanley and then that I've worked on as well in terms of CPPN and Hypernet is a really good approach for evolutionary robotics. And then a final way that we've worked on this uh, is that we had a paper in 2015 that was on the cover of Nature that produced state-of-the-art damage recovery in robots. So you imagine that you have a robot. If we want to deploy robots in the real world, they're going to become damaged, and they need to learn how to adapt when they become damaged. What you can't do is launch an expensive optimization process that takes thousands of trials to find a new behavior. Usually, the clock is ticking, survivors need to be found, and you'll probably break the robot with all of these trials that take a long time and may damage the robot further. So instead, what we did in this paper is that we harnessed the creative force of evolution offline ahead of time in simulation to collect a huge diversity of high-performing gates. This is, these are algorithms that are known as quality diversity algorithms. In this case, it was map elites. And then 
once we take that experience that was and that those that creativity and those solutions that were found by evolution when on the real robot once it becomes damaged and the clock is ticking we use bayesian optimization which is a very data efficient machine learning algorithm and so to some extent where this is an example where we're hybridizing the best of both worlds the creativity of evolution though it's expensive with the sample efficiency of bayesian optimization and what we found is that you can basically have a robot that one damage in seconds or maybe a minute or two can kind of figure out a gate that works despite that damage and soldier on with its mission or limp its way back to a repair station. So the paper was actually called Robots That Can Adapt Like Animals. And every time I explain the work, I usually give the analogy of uh, uh, an animal that's in the forest. So if you yourself are in a forest and you sprain your leg, what do you do? What you don't do is launch an optimization process that tries a bunch of subtle variations on every single theme to figure out what works. Instead, you come pre-built with intuitions that came from your childhood about very different ways to walk. And you try one type of behavior, such as walking on your, the ball of your foot. If that doesn't work, you rule out that entire family of behaviors and you try another other type of behavior, like hopping on your left foot if your right foot is injured, and you say, aha, that's good enough, and you hop out of the forest. So in this case, what we used was evolution to kind of provide that simulated childhood where you gain this knowledge of all these different ways to walk, but where you are good at walking in all those different ways. And then you use Bayesian optimization, which is very efficient to kind of live, figure out which of those is the best gait despite the damage. So I just really like that approach because it was a marriage of the creative force of evolution uh, with Bayesian optimization, a traditional machine learning algorithm. And though evolution was expensive, we kind of figured out how to do that offline ahead of time and then use a different algorithm to be data efficient when the clock is ticking. Sure. So there's lots of ways to harness evolution as an extremely creative force. I like to think about evolution as creativity in a bottle. It's almost like the ancient myth. Sometimes you open the bottle and evolution gets out and does all these mischievous things because it's so creative it can't kind of help itself from um, solving problems in ways that you might not have anticipated. So um, we just recently had a paper called The Surprising Creativity of Evolution in which we got legends from the field, pioneers from the field, all the way through some of the brightest new stars in the field to share their anecdotes of when evolution has proven to be very creative and oftentimes has surprised them. And so there's just this huge collection of anecdotes there that I love that shows time after time how routine it is when you're working with evolution to be surprised by how creative it is and how clever it is. So one answer to the question is just that evolution almost by default is exceptionally creative and will routinely surprise you. And you actually, as a scientist, have to get good at thwarting its efforts because otherwise um, it usually subverts your experimental intentions. But there is another approach which I think is extremely exciting and is to some extent the future. We've been working on it a lot lately and I think there's a lot more excitement to come. And that's not just to use evolution as a creative force, but to use evolution or any type of machine learning and, or, uh, or and stochastic optimization to produce agents that they themselves are creative. So what we want is an agent itself which is curious and seeks out novel situations and learns how to efficiently explore. And so, uh, you know, one of the first major salvos in this direction was Ken Stanley and Joel Lehman's novelty search. And so they had robots that learned to do something different than had come before than their ancestors had done. In my lab, we've done a lot of work on curiosity search, which is having an, an agent that when it wakes up in the world, it doesn't want to do something different than what was done 10 generations ago. It wants to keep doing new things in term, compared to what it's already done. So it gives, first it kind of learns to walk and then it gets bored of walking and it learns to run and then it learns to do backflips and then it goes and explores the upstairs attic and it wants to take a journey to Africa and find itself, etc. And ultimately I think that combining these two approaches will be key. One of the things that we've shown in my lab is that novelty search, which was a great idea by Joel and Ken, produces agents that not just go to new places, but they learn general skills for exploration. So when you take such an agent and you put it in an entirely new environment, it's learned how to explore, and so it kind of uh, figures out how to do that. And then increasingly we're pushing on trying to get that also applied to the idea of curiosity, where it's learning how to efficiently go to new places within its world. Uh, we've shown that these techniques produce state-of-the-art results on, um, for example, Montezuma's Revenge, the Atari game. They tie state-of-the-art there in terms of producing 
leading agents that explore this extremely challenging domain and um, collect these very sparse rewards because they're incentivized to explore. So I like both evolution as a creative force itself as an optimization algorithm and using evolution or any other machine learning algorithm to produce agents that themselves are very creative and exploratory because ultimately I think that's what we want. Robots and uh, intelligent AI agents that each of them is curious and goes off and finds new things to do in the world and new solutions to challenging problems. Sure, so I think one of the um, really brilliant insights behind novelty search is that uh, we want to reward robots or AI agents for doing different things in the behavior space. So you could imagine that if a robot was in this room and it needed to walk around, that it would be interesting if it first climbed on the couch or walked in, like opened a door, walked up a flight of stairs, etc. And that's very different from encouraging random search in the well, the genotype space or the space of neural network weights. So you could imagine that you could forever randomly mutate the weights of a neural net and encourage different neural nets, but all of them might do nothing. They might just sit there and flail their legs you know, or just fall over. That what we want to do is we want to encourage novel behaviors, novel, not novel configurations of neural nets, because two neural nets might be very similar, but one of them might write you know, uh, Shakespeare, and one of them might write a Dan Brown novel. And those are both interestingly different, m in my preference, more the Shakespeare one. And even though they might be subtle in one area, which is the weight space, they're very different in the ultimate space we care about, which is the behavior. And similarly, many, 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 many neural nets might write that same Dan, Dan Brown novel or might fall over. And so what we want to do is we want to encourage novelty in terms of the places we ultimately care about, which might be uh, different solutions to an engineering child, challenge or different behaviors that a robot performs in a very complicated environment. And that is just a profound rethink in terms of uh, the right way to do and explore novelty. And the same thing applies to curiosity. We, wa we want robots that can be curious within their lifetimes and do qualitatively different behaviors, even though their neural net might not be that different or might be actually identical. I want to um, put out one final way that I neglected to mention, which is how do you encourage creativity in robots. Uh, one of the, uh, there was some work that came out of my lab, it's called the creative thinking approach. And what I really like about this approach is it doesn't just encourage novel behaviors, it encourages novel ways of thinking about a problem. So we actually look into the brain of these neural networks and see, you see the neural activation patterns in their brain, and we say, oh, you're still kind of solving the problem similar to how agents have done it before, but you're thinking about the problem in an entirely new way. That might be a stepping stone to a later discovery, so we will encourage you uh, because we see that there are novel approaches in your brain uh, which previously people hadn't accessed as a way to encourage creativity and novelty. So that I think is a promising approach as well. So we have this paper called The Surprising Creativity of Evolution that collects all of these anecdotes. So I'll tell you about some of my favorites. I think my favorite by far is from our um, paper that we had in Nature. We were using evolution ahead of time in simulation to try to collect a huge diversity of high performing gates. And the way that we defined diversity in gates was using legs different percentages of time. So you want one robot that uses you know, five legs 90% of the time, and the six legs 10%, and then 20%, and then 30%. And literally, a corner case in this giant six-dimensional hypercube was um, challenging evolution to walk as fast as it can without ever using any of its legs. And the way that we defined using legs was touching legs to the ground. So in this case, we thought it would be impossible for evolution to walk without touching any of its legs to the ground ever, but evolution is creative and found a way. Actually, when uh, Antoine first looked at the data, he saw there was a good solution in that cell, and he thought there was a bug in his code, and he'd have to rerun everything. But he brought up the video, and evolution had basically just flipped over on its back and was crawling on its elbows, which technically doesn't use any of its legs in terms of touching any of them to the ground, but still sped across the simulated landscape. So that was quite humorous. Another example that I love actually comes from Risto Michelainen's group at, UC, uh, at the University of Texas, and they 
they had two agents that were evolving to play um, tic-tac-toe against each other, a student competition, uh, or actually maybe it was Connect Four. But they didn't put a constraint on the size of the board. So they, they, they you know, they used Connect Four with a, you know, a very, very large board, potentially infinite board. And one agent found that if it placed a piece way out, very, very, very far away from kind of the origin, then the other agents all had to allocate enough memory to try to learn how to play on that board, and that would cause those programs to crash, and they would never, pr um, they would never respond with a move, and the original agent would win by crashing the other agent's program, which was exceptionally creative. Another example that I love is that evolution was challenged to return a sorted list, you know, of all these key, you know, complicated numbers, and it would have to sort the list, and the fitness function was how many things do you have that are out of order? So evolution just deleted the entire list and returned a zero empty list, which technically does not have any things out of order, which is quite a clever solution. Uh, yet another creative solution is evolution that was encouraged to jump, where jumping was defined as how high your feet are off the ground. So what evolution did was created this extremely tall robot that would kick itself forward, somersault, and then its feet would be way off the ground without ever jumping. It would just basically fall forward, and that technically satisfied the criteria of having its legs off the ground. A final one that was, I think, maybe one of the biggest surprises to the machine learning community at large is we challenged evolution to produce pictures that would light up the different categories in a deep learning neural net. So deep, deep nets would recognize a lion or a cheetah or a motorcycle, and we had evolution produce a picture that that network would think is a lion or a motorcycle or a cheetah. We expected that if this worked, which it did, it would produce images that the, the network is certain is a motorcycle or a cheetah, but when we looked at it, it was complete garbage. And then we pr published this paper, Deep Neural Nets Are Easily Fooled, where we realized how easy it is to fool a neural network. And this came on the heels of the adversarial image is discovery by Google and that kind of those those results spread like wildfire and have actually ignited an entire field called adversary machine learning that's trying to figure out how to patch this hole in deep nuts which is that they're easily fooled and for us we learned about this problem because evolution was so created it came up with a solution we never would, would have thought of which is to produce basically white noise static which the network is convinced is any number of these different classes. Historically, we thought the answer was no. Uh, most people thought that evolution would not scale to extremely high dimensions, especially when talking about optimizing the parameters of neural networks. So recently, uh, Kalana, um, out of Michigan State, Deb has shown that you can optimize a billion parameter neural net. Uh, and we at Uber AI Labs actually found a very surprising result, which was following on the heels of OpenAI, showing that you can evolve directly the weights of huge neural nets with millions of parameters to solve some of the hardest deep reinforcement learning challenges, such as Atari and getting simulator robots to move. So Salamans et al. at OpenAI, and then our group at Uber AI Labs has showed that you can either use evolution strategies or you can use a genetic algorithm to directly evolve the weights of million parameter neural nets to solve very, very hard problems. And we also found, interestingly enough, that di the different families of evolutionary algorithms each solves problems far better, or some problems better than traditional machine learning and reinforcement learning algorithms. So it's kind of like if you have a lot of problems, you know, policy gradients or Q learning is going to solve some of them best, evolutionary strategy is going to solve some of those problems best, and then a genetic algorithm is going to solve some of them best. So each kind of has its own domain that it's best on, and it's still an open question exactly as to why that's the case. But what's nice is that evolution has thus added two new arrows to the quiver. Uh, if you have a given problem, you should probably try all four major families of reinforcement learning algorithms because one of them is probably going to work far better, and ahead of time you don't know which is which. So evolution gives us lots of additional tools to attack hard reinforcement learning and engineering challenges. An additional benefit to evolution is it's extremely scalable in terms of being parallelizable. So it's very easy to parallelize these algorithms across massive clusters of computing. Increasingly, it's not the case that one computer becomes faster and faster as the years go by, but instead that we just get lots of parallel computation, big supercomputing clusters with CPUs and GPUs. And what Salomons et al. showed and then we showed at Uber is that you can um, get these evolutionary algorithms running on massive farms of computers with hundreds or thousands of computers, and that actually makes them run far faster than a lot of reinforcement learning algorithms because they parallelize so well.
Sure. So there are many different ways to hybridize these different approaches. I think they're all tremendously exciting. And there are many in, uh, ways to hybridize them that have yet to be invented. So one thing that you can do is you can actually use evolution for deep learning. So you can directly evolve the weights of a giant neural network, like millions of parameters. And we have shown and others have shown that that works uh, quite well. Another thing that you can do is you can use deep learning to generate a set of features. So you could use like an unsupervised learning or an autoencoder or an auxiliary task to train the features of our neural net, and then you can use evolution on top to learn the policy. And recently, researchers have shown that this can produce state-of-the-art results or extremely good results for reinforcement learning challenges. Uh, so that's an exciting approach. You can also hybridize some of the ideas from the neuroevolution community, such as CPPNs and indirect encodings, but actually use them with differentiable techniques to produce like what are called now hypernetworks. Um, another feature uh, or another approach is very promising is that you use evolution as an outer loop in a meta-learning context, and you use some deep learning algorithm or deep reinforcement learning algorithm as the inner loop. So for example, on the outer loop, you could evolve the architecture, and on the inner loop, you could have SGD solving some computer vision problem. And the people at Sentient have done a great job of showing that that is a, is a very powerful approach. And also at Google Brain, they've shown that that approach produces state-of-the-art results on ImageNet and CIFAR, which is amazing because for a decade now, basically, almost, people have been hand-tuning architectures to try to solve these challenging problems and it, it turns out that evolution can find even better architectures than that army of human scientists was able to produce with their best, you know, with the brightest minds in the field. Um, it's also particularly exciting, I think, to increasingly push on meta-learning approaches where you have evolution as an outer loop, not just for architecture, but for solving hyper or optimizing hyperparameters or even the al learning algorithm itself, uh, and, but producing a network that has millions of weights. And so technically, it's a deep learning network with evolution as the outer loop meta-learning. Um, there are even more exotic hybrids that are using combinations of deep learning and um, evolutionary algorithms. Uh, we at Uber iLabs have taken ideas such as novelty search and high hybridize them with deep learning to encourage exploration for, you know, for uh, deep reinforcement learning algorithms. And there are people that are inventing new crossover and mutation operators by harnessing gradient-based methods. And increasing, uh, recently at Uber iLabs, um, led by Joel Lehman, we have a paper on safe mutations in which we have basically in, created a new space in which you can use gradients within evolution. So you use gradients to um, get the desired change in outputs of a neural net that's being evolved. And, but, and and then you kind of see what happens and how good of an idea that is when you actually run it in your simulator. So there's an explosion of hybridizations between deep learning and neuroevolution that are producing a wealth of new ideas. And to some extent, it's like somebody opened up new doors in an orchard and there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. And we're seeing so far a lot of that fruit being picked and um, being beneficial. But there's lots more to be picked and explored. Yeah, I think there are many. So uh, the paper that we had in Nature on robot damage recovery, I think, is a great area for robotics companies to take advantage of that pr approach, which used evolution and Bayesian optimization to um, very quickly adapt to new environments. And we showed that it uh, not only can adapt to new damaged bodies if the robot becomes damaged, but also to changes in the environment. There's no fundamental difference between adapting to a new change in my body or adapting to the environment slightly changing. In fact, there's a great example where uh, Jean-Baptiste and company at their university in France, when the paper got on uh, the cover of Nature, the university wanted some VIPs to come see the, the robot in action. So they, the night before, they um, got the room ready and the demo ready, the robot's going to walk. They weren't actually going to have the robot learn. That would be too risky for a live demo. They were just going to like have the robot, the gate that was learned by the robot, walk in front of this very important person. Uh, so they got everything set up, they went home, and the university, because it was a VIP, they sent in the janitorial crew to clean the lab, which meant mopping and polishing the floors with a super shiny dose of new wax. So when they got in in the morning with the VIP, they looked around and they said, wow, this is never going to work. This is now like an ice rink. This isn't what we, we practiced on. But they said, we do have a learning algorithm that should be able to adapt. So they ran the learning algorithm live, the intelligent trial and error algorithm. And it, within a couple of experiments, it figured out a new way to walk despite the slippery floor, and the robot was off and walking across the lab. So there's an example of an algorithm that in a live demo in a new situation still worked. And that's what you need for real world applications. It's something that is robust enough to work in totally new situations. I also think that there's been a lot of different companies over the years that have um, shown that evolution can be very powerful in a 
commercial setting. So Red Cedar by Eric Goodman um, has been doing industrial applications in the automotive sector uh, with evolutionary algorithms. At Sentient, they're doing lots of work in many different verticals showing the benefits of evolutionary algorithms. Um, and I think that there are many other uh, application areas that have been uh, done over the years. For example, I think Sony, when they first had the Ibo robot, they wanted uh, a running gate, but they didn't know how to program it by hand. So they called up Greg Hornby, who was at NASA at the time, and he used an evolutionary algorithm to evolve the first walking gate for the Ibo robot from Sony, and that was shipped by Sony with that consumer robot device. Similarly, at NASA, there, there was an, in, a call for um, engineers talent for, to produce an antenna and all the engineers could try to produce the best antenna and whoever produced the best antenna they would fly to space. Greg Hornby used an evolutionary algorithm to produce an antenna that was better than any of NASA engineers and that was put on a space uh, satellite and flown to space which is extremely expensive. So that's not quite a commercial application but it shows that evolutionary algorithms are game time ready to um, help uh, solve very challenging engineering problems of the sort that companies have routinely. Yeah, so this has been a central research question within the neuroevolution community and evolutionary algorithms community more broadly uh, for quite a while. I should start by saying that all stochastic optimization algorithms face the problem of convergence and running in local optima. So if you look at uh, deep reinforcement learning, or if you look at deep learning, or if you look at neural evolution, what you see is almost the same curve in every single um, scientific paper. It's like it runs, goes up steeply at the beginning, and then it flatlines, more or less. And so the question is, how do we prevent that flatline from happening? And one of the answers is that you want to encourage intelligent diversity, and you want intelligent exploration. So there has been a lot of very interesting and pioneering work done in uh, the neuroevolution community on uh, novelty search and curiosity search. We've already talked about some of those things. Um, but we still have a long way to go. If you watch how our algorithms explore, they still don't do it intelligently. They don't do it like a human does or a, a child does. They don't do things like saying, I have never been over there. I want to go over there and figure out what's happening over there. Uh, they don't model the world. They aren't curious about places where their models currently don't work well. So um, to some extent, we have the broad strokes ideas, and we have a notion of what we want to do, but we've never seen anything implemented that intelligently explores in the way that animals and humans do. And we that's what's missing. It's one of the major key ingredients that's missing, is intelligent exploration uh, uh, of the world to find good solutions. So one of the approaches that I love is the one that I mentioned from our nature paper, where you embrace the fact that evolution is expensive, but extremely creative. And so you let it go crazy with lots of compute, but you do that offline ahead of time, either in, simula yeah, you know, in simulation, and then you intelligently extract the best of what evolution found uh, with efficient algorithms when the clock is ticking. So in that way, you can harness evolution v in a very sample efficient way, but not by using evolution for the sample efficiency. And so in that case, with a handful of experiments in just a few seconds or a few minutes, you are finding a, an evolved solution very quickly, but not by running evolution. So that's one answer. Another answer is meta-learning. So you, um, you use a lot of computation to learn how to learn. So evolution spent untold amounts of computation to produce me and produce you. And what are we? We are amazing learning machines, and we are very sample efficient. But we were learned via evolution, which is very sample inefficient. So by t using tons of compute, we can have agents that learn how to learn, but the end result of that process is an agent that itself learns very quickly and in a very sample efficient manner, and that can run on your phone. So uh, I don't personally think that the answer is likely to be evolution running you know, the simplest possible sense, but using evolution to produce something that's sample efficient. A final thing that also I think is a very good idea is surrogates. So you use evolution, you figure out a good model for the true problem, which is very expensive to compute, and you do a lot of evolution on the model of that problem, the surrogate, and you learn things that are a pretty good idea, and then you transfer them uh, to the real world and you hope that they work or you only need a very few iterations to get them to work. So all of these approaches, the common theme is, you know, 
Uh, let evolution be evolution. Let it be creative. Let it be expensive. Let it be compute intensive. Let it find wonderful uh, solutions and be creative. And then kind of distill that in an efficient way when the clock is ticking. And like in nature, uh, you know, we don't often solve problems with live evolution. We solve problems by letting evolution come up with something that can solve the problem efficiently. Sure, so uh, one answer is that there is literally tens of thousands of people and an army of people that are trying to come up with every new idea in deep learning and deep reinforcement learning. To some extent, evolution is um, less well-trodden. It's um, an undiscovered country and it is probably therefore um, easier for somebody to make a big breakthrough because you're not competing with an army of people. Uh, it's also, you know, in research and science, usually it's the bigger advances and the more unconventional advances that make the biggest waves. And there's lots of opportunity in the evolution community, neuroevolution community, kind of come up with the next big idea, which might not only help and improve the neuroevolution community, but cross right over and help the entire machine learning community and deep reinforcement learning community. So we've seen evidence of ideas in neuroevolution and in evolutionary algorithms that have then been you know, gone to the wider community with great fanfare and great impact. But they were kind of nurtured on this island where you can be a little bit more of a radical thinker and you're, you, know, you have a little less group thinking because there's fewer people, there's, it's an opportunity for diversity in thinking. Uh, so it's a place where you can make a tremendous amount of impact and maybe come up with an unconventional idea. I'd also say that there's kind of a growing recognition by a lot of experts in neuroevolution but also in traditional machine learning and reinforcement learning that evolution may be the next big thing. That what we want to do in evolution uh, and what we're able to do in evolution is optimize things that are non-differentiable, that have very long time horizons, uh, things like meta-learning and things like very sparse exploration problems. And evolution is a, a technique that allows you to do that. So to some extent, you know, deep learning I think is fantastic and reinforce, deep reinforcement learning is a great technique and I, and I do research in those fields and I think they will continue to produce major advances. But evolution may be um, something that is ripe for a major tipping point and so you could kind of get in uh, right before this really takes off and be a pioneer of a field that eventually is going to be tremendously important for the broader field of machine learning and will probably synergize with machine learning to produce uh, true artificial intelligence. So I think it's a tremendously exciting time to join the evolutionary algorithms community, but not to do it, you know, without being aware of and maybe hybridizing with ideas from machine learning and reinforcement learning. You don't have to do one or the other, but uh, inevitably you have to pick areas of focus. And I think that it is a tremendously exciting area to choose and bet, say, a PhD on or a couple of years. Um, I certainly have found it to be tremendously rewarding. Uh, this is what keeps me up every night and wakes me up excited every morning to come into the lab. I'm actually currently writing an article that will outline um, what I think are some of the missing ingredients and what is a path forward for evolution. So to some extent I have to say watch this space because that's not quite ready. But at a high level I think that there is a tremendous amount that we haven't yet figured out about what created the explosion of complexity and intelligence that we see on Earth. To some extent, we still haven't figured out what evolution did and how it did what it did, and that makes for a tremendous amount of exciting research. So um, one thing that is clearly missing in my mind are complicated enough environments. So evolution bootstrapped itself up by producing not only the solutions to each niche, but the collection of niches that got invaded by evolution. And some sort of a bootstrapping open-ended process that produces an endless bounty of niches and then solution to niches is a, a very exciting thing. I also think we haven't yet pushed hard enough on meta-learning where you have something like evolution in an outer loop and then something like learning in an inner loop uh, where you are optimizing the learning or you're learning how to learn. Uh, there's been work on that in our fields from my lab and from Andrea Soltogio and by Ken Stanley's lab and many other people have worked in this area, but uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, so I think it's a tremendously exciting time in this field because we have increasing amounts of computation that allow us to start to do some of the wonderful things that happened in the natural world and in evolution. Um, but we still have a lot to figure out in terms of what really is going to produce uh, an algorithm that might generate open-ended complexity or might generate artificial intelligence itself.